Welcome to the Brooklyn Rail Wednesday afternoon reading series. This is the, um, God, what is it? The 119th poetry reading that's been happening online here as part of this series. And overall, the 732nd New Social Environment event, which seems to be mind boggling that so many have happened. When we get to thousand, we might all explode into confetti or something like that. Um, today's reading has been uh, curated by Brenda Ijima and it's called Prismatic Prose and Poetry. And Brenda will be, I'll turn things over to Brenda in just a second to uh, introduce the various readers. Um, Brenda will be joined by Alvia Wilk, Giad Gonzalez, Daisy Hildyard, Annie Wan, and Ann Yoder. Um, before I introduce Brenda, I just want to say a couple quick things. If you have not been to one of these uh, online readings, you might take a look at the chat during the reading. As each person comes up to read, there'll be information posted about the work uh, they're doing and various publications and links to things. There'll also be some information about the rail. My name is Anselm Bergen. I'm the uh, editor of the poetry section, and I work with uh, the various folks here on this series as well. It's great to have Brenda here um, to put this together. Brenda is a poet, novelist, playwright, choreographer, and visual artist, author of nine books of poems. Her current work engages submerged and occluded histories other than human modes of expression and telluric awareness in all forms. A play, Daily Life in China, is forthcoming from Ellis Press in 2023. A novel, Presence, is forthcoming from Georgia Review Press also this year. And a novella called A Roundtable Unanimous Dreamers Chime In, written in collaboration with Janice Lee, is forthcoming from Meekling Press and a collaborative chapbook, The Center for Hierarchical Thinking, written with Annie Wan, is due out uh, also later this year. Jima is the founding editor and publisher of Portable Press at Yo-Yo Labs, and she lives in Brooklyn. Please welcome Brenda to the Rail, the Rail Reading Series. Thank you, Anselm, and thank you, everyone at Brooklyn Rail, Carolyn, Chloe, Eleanor. Um, it's so great to have this forum. And I'm really excited to hear everyone's reading today. I just have some short introductory words that I will read. So we find ourselves within the matrix of cyberspace where the virtual and the tact tact tactile meet through the interface of clouds, data centers, computers, body minds in materiality and that which is imagined conceptual coming in and out of being all cooled and heated by reactions within systems. I envisioned this reading as a scintillating confluence and gathering along a centering of ecological consciousness because this term is able to support a wide ranging inclusion of everything that life consists of historical contingency, bio and social, power dynamics, gender, political salience, geological fact, et cetera, and the morphings of category. Human can slowly dissolve out of its dominance in the mix. All the writers I've invited, whether poet or prose writer, engage language, ideas, and ethics, as well as experience and utterly sensitive prosody where recognitions flourish. I'm an uninvited resident of Canarsie territory. The readers I'm presenting are scattered throughout the world. Anne in Finland, Daisy in the United Kingdom, Annie in Malden, Mass, via Israel, Elvia, I'm not sure, and Gia also probably two miles away from where I'm located. This reading is dedicated to Leonard Peltier and the collective efforts of seeking clemency for Leonard of Turtle Mountain Chippewa tribe in North Dakota, who is serving two consecutive life term, terms of life imprisonment. 
He has been in a federal prison since 1977, 45 years and eight months. He was wrongfully imprisoned. Many facts have been revealed that provide that proved his trial was severely flawed. Lately, there has been a lot of momentum for Leonard's release. Please contact your representatives, urging them to put pressure on President Biden to grant his release. I will give the briefest intro for each reader so that there is maximum time for the readings. Elvia Wilk writes at the intersections of ecology and cultural affect. Her new collection, her, her new essay collection, Death by Landscape, is brilliant articulation of how weird terrestrial life ways are. Gia Gonzalez is a poet who engages themes of sex, power, and a critique of imperialist, imperialist imposition into a formal lyricism. Her recently published chapbook, Render Sleaze, is potent. Daisy Hilliard is an author of The Second Body and other texts, which had a, such an impact on ideas of the body and lived experience in contemporary times where epic systems of interaction cause experience to be multiple simultaneously as global objects and intimate beings. Annie One is the author of multiple texts, most recently a collaboration with me called the Center of Hierarchical Manufacturing, soon out on Double Cross Press. And um, Ann Yoder is the author of The Enhancers, a story that focuses on a community in the near possible future whose nexus is a pharmaceutical company that manufactures dubious mood enhancing pills that the community must compl comply in taking. But there are modes of escape and immersion into a more diversified ecosystem on the fringes. And lastly, I'll read a short excerpt from a novella I wrote in collaboration with Janice Lee called A Roundtable Unanimous Dreamers Chime In, in which, uh, sorry, which will be published this spring by Meekling Press. Okay, um, so Elvia will uh, take us from there. Thank you so much. Hi, am I hearable? Great. Thank you, Brenda, for the introduction, and thank you so much to our hosts. Um, I really appreciate the acknowledgments that were made. Um, I'm just going to dive in. I will read for like six minutes and 30 seconds, <laughs> which um, should keep things moving along. We just have so many wonderful readers, and I'm just really um, grateful to be in your company and excited to hear from you. The piece I'll read um, was originally written to accompany an exhibition by the artist Robert Irwin um, at Light Art Space, um, a pretty new institution in Berlin. And um, it was funny because I didn't get to see his installation. And if you know his work, it was <laughs> it's entirely about perception and phenomenology. So this included me doing a lot of imaginary work um, and thinking through his practice over time. Um, and it became kind of its own short story. It's called The Yard. I had been told that seeing the blue marble from above was going to be the greatest moment in my life, but nothing compared to the sensation of stepping back onto the flat ground of earth. The sky, the horizon line, the shock of sun, crowds, parking lots, forests, my own feet. My eyes watered as they readjusted to the full, glorious, overwhelming vastness of the surface-bound world. At first, it was simple sensory overload. I'd grown used to the aesthetic paucity of orbit, those gray padded walls, the control panels, blinking lights, the two porthole windows. And now I was dazzled by the visual noise. During my first days back, I was plunged into synesthesia, confused about how the input was penetrating my system. I found myself covering my ears or clamping my mouth shut when a bright, loud shape zoomed into focus. It reminded me of the way I used to lower the volume of the car stereo when driving around looking for the right address. Too many stimuli. I had to ration my intake so as not to get sick from gorging. 
My eyes didn't know how to consume the glut of information. For days and months adding up to a year, I had watched the world pass below from a satellite container. I had followed the curve of my elliptical path in real time on a glowing monitor, constantly checking my speed and velocity. I was floating, confined, static, trapped in perpetual motion, a paradox, tied to the earth but impossibly distant from it. Sometimes I felt that the invisible lasso holding me to the planet could snap at any moment and fling me off into nothingness. I distrusted the earth to keep me on a tether. Of course, metaphors like lassos and tethers are totally inaccurate. That's not how gravity works at all. But then the images people use to describe impossible things always fall short. That used to bother me when I was a student. The neat ways my teachers tried to explain things whose very existence is a true catastrophe for the brain. A black hole is a galaxy-sized vacuum cleaner. Quantum particles act on each other across distances like fraternal twins. Black holes are not Dyson vacuums and particles are not twins. No description gets to the point, which is that you will never sense a black hole or a quantum particle. You can only grasp the fact of its existence for a fleeting moment by surrendering your own tethers to the world you touch, taste, smell, hear, and see. Living in low G comes with plenty of side effects. Your bone density diminishes. Your blood circulation slows. Radiation enters your organs. Your neck arteries swell. Your eyeballs elongate into oblong shapes, worsening your eyesight and sometimes creating distortions. Scientists can explain most of these things through observable changes. They can measure the convexity of my corneas and delineate the shift in curvature. But I suspect that in space, I was also transformed on a cellular level, perhaps in ways that can't be measured at all. The body is more than the sum of its parts. Eyesight changes in any tight and closed space. One of the cruelest aspects of solitary confinement, I think, is that it destroys a person's capacity to shift between short and long range, long range vision. Even if the room has a window, it's not enough to expand the visual field. The world beyond the window gains a flat hyperreal quality, not at all like a landscape with depth and range. Eventually, the lack of distance vision destroys the close range view as well. Seeing up close turns out to be dependent on its opposite. This leads me to think that we only see through juxtaposition by judging one aspect against another. Near or far, light or dark, yellow or green. When trapped, the eye loses its ability to decide. I found that when you have nothing but a window representing the space beyond your quarters, the window takes on the quality of a screen. After the third month in orbit, I couldn't make myself see what lay beyond the portholes as anything but renderings, like CGI images of something that may or may not exist. The windows might as well have been any of the other computer monitors inside the capsule, showing views of Earth and simulations of my path. It was not in my job description to leave the module, so I had no way of reconciling the flatness I saw with three-dimensional space. I never felt surrounded by the expanse. I was looking at a picture of it. After returning, I moved back into my old house. It took me several weeks to readjust to the brilliance of light, shadow, and depth. I relearned to filter signal from noise. It was then that the flatness began. I tried to explain this to the company doctor. The pervading sense, even long after I had landed, that I was still looking at a series of screens rather than a multi-dimensional world. She nodded and took notes. She said she hadn't heard this particular description before, but that I shouldn't be too concerned. At least 80% of people in my position regain regular vision after a year living on Earth again. I didn't tell her that I was not eager to be cured. Secretly, it felt more like a discovery than a defect. I started spending hours in my backyard in stillness, closing and opening one eye and then the other. I thought I knew the yard. I took it for granted. I'd lived there for years, but now it seemed foreign, alien. 
I turned my head back and forth, up and down, regarding the field from all angles, trying to resolve what I told myself must be an optical illusion. Still, the yard presented itself as a series of thin or even totally depthless screens. Sometimes a few of them and sometimes dozens of them laid out against one another. I tried and tried to reconcile them into a single deep field in my mind's eye. The mind's eye. What other eye is there? In the center of my yard was an old twisted tree with flaking bark. The foliage was overgrown on one side with vines and a thicket of low dark leafed plants with roughly textured stems. On the other side, an empty patch of dry lawn clocked the sun as it moved overhead. I sat on my wooden patio a foot or so above the earth. I leaned against the back door, testing the air with my nose, batting my eyelashes, comparing the day's light and temperature to that of the day before. Birds roosted in the gnarled elm. Insects swarmed around my ankles. The wind shifted and lifted my hair from my forehead. A brown shadow spilled down the grass. One leaf tapped another. A gray squirrel leapt from a tree branch and instantly passed, skipped from a far screen to a close one. I paced the perimeter of the yard, counting my steps, moving through space and time. And the screens moved with me. They turned to me, flatness upon flatness, wherever I looked. I cast my glance sideways in a flash, furtively trying to catch the side of a screen, an edge, but they constantly rearranged themselves. I knew the screens weren't real, but I wasn't sure it mattered what I knew. My eyes knew it. I hovered in that space of unease. I relished it. I held my breath when the squirrel returned and made its jump, the thrill of that instant skip. I never managed to glimpse a screen from any angle but the front. They were always facing me. They had to be, as I was the center of my world with my eyes at the front of my face. In a sense, I realized my world revolved around me. It revolves around every person dependent on each organism with its unique assemblage of miraculous sensing attributes. In the way that the planets revolve around one another and at this very moment, countless satellites revolve around the earth, so too is the world tethered to the eyes that see it. As autumn transitioned into winter and the screens that composed my backyard astounded me with their changing shadows, I knew I did not need to go on any other mission. I was already in orbit and being orbited. The end. Thank you. Sorry, am I supposed to read now? <laughs> okay, um, great. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a little bit out of it. I've been having some um, vertigo today, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try my best. But I'm 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 very happy to be here with all of you. Um, and thank you so much to the Brooklyn Rail and uh, to Brenda. Um, and that was wonderful, Elvia. Thank you. Um, so let me see, I think I'm just going to start by reading some, um, reading a poem called, um, Was She Known to Order? I opened my mouth, a normative conveyance act, the A of mores. And I wanted so badly to ask of you, in a spectacle of indignation, euphemism, decorum's filigree. Your speaking invoked in me a desire to speak, my place a fixed point, I spoke, broaching a distance. I spoke to you who blinked idly away, uh, my speaking in unpartnered speech cut a line of desire through ordinary air. I regard you speaking the why of erudite. 
I speak in an opportune moment, your throat closing needily around. My point was not necessarily made. A hedging sound made of mouth, all hesitance, affect, excruciating. All of a sonic word. To it, slowly and gradually, to this word. To allow even just a tiny part of it to sound a normal pronunciation of this word. Needy mouth actions for ground naive forms, mouth elicits the low throated note. At night there was no dismissal and meant you in adoration. What I spoke from my place, a fixed point, a placeholder. I spoke to you in a heightened moment, preverbal and opening as sound, no single thing referred. I spoke to you directly as demarcation regarding this. We converse, you take it well, the A of timbre. You regard me as I regard you. With my mouth on you, I am responsive to you. You are finally with me. You are the only true greed, commencing a paroxysm of language. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to read poems, I think, without just, just in one, uh, streak, <laughs> um, that just feels right to me right now. Passing through a pane of bleeding light, what saw falsely a square outlasting its folds, writ large in creamy false shadow became a method of expulsion, each white opacity more infuriating than the next. You make a way, a way out, walking through your room with clarity, feigning coy, playing pleasure, making shadow in the other room. Your pose means chaste luxury as gauze becomes a demarcating factor and the edge unfinished becomes its own and larger subject. Returning myself, my eye to my eye, my face to my face, I noticed I was in a quiet, spacious, and white-walled apartment adorned by undulating sun in an aquatic pattern. My apartment. At present, there were no cedary smells, just a roundish lack of novelty. I swing my feet in this uncharged and limited space. The joy, of course, is that each room has utility, and then my nerve struck me and I was bedded with a magisterial sense of dread. At night, winnowing illusion into little shapes, gnarly forms, hunger striping the stomach, willing this room's gestation into tomorrow. These pains erase the day. Then the round and cloying smell of skin in sleep headily fills me. This morning, my status is uncouth, feeling miraculous, or this is one way to put it, flouncy's lacking the correct timbre. Okay, now just ministrations on the body, back to the body. I want to be the first to know. All letters indeed are bolded in my inbox. Perspirations a kindly sheen on me all through the day. My inability to portend is what keeps it propulsive, angling the nail for sure entrance. Okay, let's begin on this note of sureness. Well, now the entrance is overwrought with nothing meager following. This is hardly an image of animalistic devotion to one another. I was crowded in my perception of joy. Um, and then I'm going to read um, from the chapbook that uh, Brenda mentioned earlier that I just published with Portable Press. Um, this is from Render Sleaze, but um, it's a sequence of um, prose poems um, in response to watching um, exploitation films shot in the Philippines in the 1970s. Um, and it's called um, by, by American producers. Um, and this is called uh, The Butch, The Naive, and The Mousy Panay. Green, scared, and pretty. There's a red-white disambiguation in the virgin landscape, my little white doll who bathes in tainted water. 
yet something of self-knowledge, the unworried concoction of aerosoled hair, gaudies the tableau. An ecstasy of shock on the colonial caning. The butch, the naive, and the mousy panai surrounding her aroused her white agony, cut to the butch who wipes her finger on her shirt. Beyond the pale. Of her complexion, she was taught that with it, this green goes. She was built like a tank in drabs and her face was undone, though the unbecoming mark upon it was popularly said to indicate beauty. The rich landscape aflame cheaply. So paid, the brown boy was made to throw himself with vigor against the glass, a carabao chewing distantly on a long frond. By this logic, first defiled, then exploded, is a fate not so much to be pitied as depended on. Their end goal a failure. Gleaming sheaths of straight black hair, under which two twins labor aimlessly in the loamy, sucking dirt. Meanwhile, the blonde speaks with breath and enunciation of solitary to the overwrought Teuton. In a bamboo cage, clasping her arms around her knees, she signaled to herself and to others the perceived superfluousness of her presence. What she did was bounce in transport on the haphazard wagon. She drank them under the table. Was it her exceptional brown body which permitted her to do so? Of all the things I might have expected, was it the sexlessness of her fatigues, her androgyny? Against a dark brown background, she perceives the unscrupulous oriental in wide-eyed demonstration of the blue within, punished for her swarthy attraction. He had that Neanderthal look to begin with, natively disturbing plants for food, whose indistinguishable mass of bitter leaves repulsed the pinched-nosed prisoner. A good ass up in smoke. So flame allows the indecorous femme who had, in pigtails, allowed herself to be led behind a curtain, a drab sheet, and grovel maudlinly, who made a body spectacle and could demonstrate the terror of her own defilement by allowing herself merely to be positioned in the foreground where she was drank or swallowed up as easily as milk. The Constancy of the Nude Panty with her hair done up and curled, she disavows herself of tropical misfortune in the communal shower. Thank you. And thanks for bearing with me in my <laughs> vertigo brain. Thank you, Kia. <clears throat> Am I up? Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kia, and thank you, Alvia. Um, I'm very happy to be here as a listener as well as a, as a reader. Um, and thanks the Brooklyn Rail and Brenda for asking me. Um, I'm going to read uh, about nine minutes from my novel Emergency. I'm just going to read from the beginning. So hopefully it doesn't need much introduction. Um, but it's a novel set in a rural community and I wanted the novel to tell the stories of um, many different species and beings who were in that community and different stories that unfold from, from them all. One spring evening when I was old enough to be outside and alone I was sitting above the quarry on the edge of the village when I saw a panel of clay drop away from the facing vertical side and fall into a pool of water. Behind it, the interior of an animal's burrow was revealed in relief, like a bombed house with one wall removed. Inside, instead of wallpaper or dangling wires, there was one globe-shaped hollow lined with fluff and leaf mold, and passages leading from it which all ran through the roots of the turf with one exception, the long tunnel which dropped down into the earth, then turned at an angle in a stretched V shape and began to rise again. Inside the passage, heading upward, there was a small animal. Whether it was a mouse, a shrew or a vole, I couldn't see. 
Parallel to this creature, high above the pool of water on the quarry bed, there was a female kestrel floating. The two creatures were at eye level with one another. The kestrel tilted and allowed herself to rise just a little faster than the animal. Then the animal disappeared from my view, coming up through the ground. Meanwhile, the kestrel continued to ascend towards the cloud until, abruptly, she stopped. She stopped absolutely as though somebody had pressed pause. Only the way her position varied very slightly, tilting one way and then another, showed that she was holding herself against a current. Holding my gaze on her, I rose slowly and as smoothly as I could and skirted along the track that ran around the quarry at the top, taking care to make no sudden movement and to give the bird a wide berth so that she didn't flit. She must have been able to see me. She didn't move. From the track, I could see the animal again, a large vole, male, hiding under a clump of dead turf that overhung the track. He wasn't in the kestrel's eye line. We all waited to find out who would move first. There was a clear bronze early evening light and a cold breeze. The grasses flickered. Then the vole made a sudden break, dashing into the open and stopping in the middle of the road, right where he was most exposed. I stood at the edge of the track like a tree. He was almost at my feet. The kestrel allowed her equilibrium to be disturbed. She tipped her body, carved a line in the air, and came to hover directly above the vole. Still, he remained in the same place. I could see him intimately now. His features were precise and miniature. Acorn cup ears, thread fine whiskers radiating in all directions and tiny hand-shaped feet. His whole body was vibrating violently. The kestrel had paused again and my gaze moved up and down drawing a direct line between them as a lift draws a line between two floors of a building. I felt a sense of love arise in me, as huge and widespread as the vole was small and specific, and it occurred to me that I could rescue him. I knew what this would mean because I'd done it before. When the huge black rabbit who had lived in a run in our garden had a nest full of babies, my parents had told me not to touch them. <clears throat> I sat outside the hutch and waited for them to be revealed when their mother rolled aside, tiny pink squirming things. When they were a week old, skin still visible through a sheen of black fur, my mother explained why I wasn't to touch them. The rabbits, she said, would eat her babies if they had a strange smell on them. I held my hands in front of my face, but they didn't smell like anything except faintly soap. My mother left and I stayed watching the rabbits for a while. Then I put one in my pocket, closed the lid of the hutch at the end of the run and ran down the drive along the street and into Claire's garden. Claire wasn't there, but Nick was sitting on the back step, step with a mug of tea and a biscuit one cigarette sitting beside her on the warm brick. She was always there, waiting like that when Claire came home from school. I closed the gate and approached warily up the path until I was in front of her, waiting for a sign that she had recognized me, but she wasn't much interested in my presence. She was looking over my shoulder. I glanced behind me, but there was nothing there, only the sun setting over the fields and the quarry. There was a small yellowish scar below the outer edge of one of her eyes, which very slightly affected its shape. So there was always something unusual about her face. But in that moment, she was looking toward the sun and her brown iris seemed to have been set on fire, which gave her a blind, illuminated look. And I felt afraid of her. Then it passed and I said, hi, is Claire playing? 
Nick didn't say hello to me or speak in the indulgent but dishonest tone that adults usually used when speaking to me at that time in my life. Distractedly, still looking with disturbing directness into the sun, she told me that Claire wasn't home, she'd gone to her grands, she'd be back in a minute. Adam was inside, watching a cartoon if I wanted to wait. In the front room, Adam was cross-legged on the floor, very close to a television, having bricked himself into a low wall of wooden blocks. I kneeled behind him and we sat quietly together to watch a squirrel being electrocuted, then guillotined, having its head glued back on, having its eyes plucked out and being run over by a truck. And then Nick opened the curtains and turned off the sound and asked me whether I wanted to stay for dinner. And I said, yes. She asked me whether my parents would reply and would mind, and I didn't reply. Then there was a thump. Claire's school bag was on the mat where the post would land, <clears throat> and Claire silhouetted behind it in the open doorway. Why is there a ladder on the side of the house? She announced. Nick said, your dad's fixing a leak in the guttering. Adam, said Claire, would you like to go up that ladder? Adam knocked down his wall of bricks and not toddled over to Claire, who took his hand. They went outside and I followed. Claire and I stood at the bottom of the ladder, holding it steady while Adam slowly climbed up the wall. The ladder wasn't going anywhere. It didn't reach the roof. And that side of the house had only one small window right at the top. Between the red bricks, the mortar was covered over by mosses which traced out a regular but complicated shape, a dark green maze. Down here, near the ground, the mosses were plush, with threads like walking sticks sticking out of their surfaces. Looking at their still, shadowy softness, I felt a deep, calm feeling drop through me. On the upper part of the wall above me, where the full sun hit the brick, they had dried and died. But on the other side, above Claire's head, the corpses had come back to life. It wasn't a miracle. The leak in the guttering, which I couldn't see, was revealed by a widening spill of water that illuminated the mosses, which had advanced out over the brick where it was wet, thickening and growing emerald and black. Even at that age, I could see that it wasn't ideal for the wall. I realized that the sense of stillness that the mosses opened up inside me, which I experienced as a feeling, was in fact a pace. We were out of step. I moved through mornings and school days, months and dinners, while the mosses somewhere beyond my time frame moved through their alien periods of death and spreading. When I turned away from the wall, Claire's head was almost touching mine. Her eyes were darker than her mother's, almost black. I must have stared open mouthed because she dropped her jaw like an idiot. And then I felt something moving inside my jacket. Oh, I said, look, I stepped back from the ladder and took my hands off it to take a tiny rabbit out of my pocket. I'm going to stop there. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Awesome. So... I'm Annie, and I imagine you know Brenda. Thanks so much to Brooklyn Rail and Brenda for helping organize and for this amazing assembly of readers. Um, definitely in gratitude for being in your company. Uh, this is a, a um, the collaborative chapbook that Brenda and I have in press right now with Double Press, um, Double Cross Press is a little zombie manuscript which was um, birthed and buried about 10 years ago um, before COVID happened. And it dug itself up and clawed Brenda 
um, who obeyed what it said and sent it to press. So, um, Brenda and I are only its media. Okay. So this is from the Center for Hierarchical Manufacturing. The Center for Hierarchical Manufacturing is considering whether you belong. It is assembling the future. It is highly capable, palatable, and often grins. It is bent of sunlight, favors positive anatomies, which are strongly controlled by remote joysticks. In a back room, a gendered being who is downloading your brain onto a microchip for future memory. The very flexible person is a highly efficient machine, a factory ecology of donated cells. Remind me which bin you came from. At some point, you were mislabeled. Skin color may vary. Behavioral differences are metered by time and specific genetic modification. Delivered by refrigerated trucks, stacked dry ice boxes, barcoded. The delivery person asks for a fingerprint to carry away characteristics you can buy with your black eyes, pink fruiting skin, steady hands. Explain what is for sale when a cell transfers hands. Hands transfer cells. We cannot escape ourselves. Pipette carefully because contents will be disturbed. Content and disturbed. The agitator mixes cells much like this all day, all night, forward and back. Vanishing caloric density. The erosion of mountain ranges. Sand drops. It drops. George Washington's face minus half a nose. The dust it builds, it creates. Fat. Spaces between words. Occupy. Occupy. Heavy feet on unyielding ground. Like sweetness or bitterness. Both. Together. Or love. I told you. I want. A mouthfeel that has all the power. Imagine a fist in your mouth. Shazam. Give me liberty or give me Doritos. An arrow to the trigeminal nerve. Scatter the chips on my grave. A blowback of ingredients. Most chemicals have a melting point. Kathy in the middle of the room, for example. If she could melt into the wall, she does melt into the wall. The specific degree matter turns liquid. There was a time when we were a primeval crowd. There was a time when feelings expressed something. I'd like to acknowledge the touch of the change code, the feel of the smoke screen to the psychic interface. Somewhere in the mind is a smoke screen. A hand could pass and disappear. Don't try to capture the air. It is always moving. Mother went out to buy a machine and came back with you. All your parts and plastic boxes drilled and assembled, sanitized with microbes. You are a piece. Move less for the camera. No turning your chin, one foot and the other, one foot and the other, polished and whittled. At night, the river that is melted wonders why it has run dry. There is no time to consider why you would like to talk about it. The dry earth will not entertain any questions at this time. It is dry. Do you have any concerns? Science taught us that this river should not run purple. There is no time for our imagination. Return to your books, study for the new times. When you have emerged, a new whole world will be contained. Close your eyes and then open them. Close your eyes and then open them. 
If I dose twice, will the medicine be twice as effective? Where is the medicine? The quality of medical knowledge is lacking. If I dose three times, I can surely tell it's working. Everything works better when it's done three times. I hate when I'm buying organic vegetables. I go home and they turn out to be nuclear weapons. I hate when I'm buying organic vegetables. I go home and my arm is attached to my foot. My foot carries extra toes and my bag of groceries has extra eyeballs. Lunch poem. Ethene gas. Noun. Natural ripening agent or how I found myself in a container with four walls and no ceiling. 15%. In this scenario, the sky is an accumulation of gases and atmosphere comes from deep earth. Soy lecithin. Noun. Conditions of bodies trapped in small spaces and blended. 5%. To eat the contents will greatly minimize your chance for survival. Sugar makes me sad. Too much sugar makes me eat more. See carbohydrates. She's now in an unlined drum. Synaptic spaces notwithstanding. Drums of uncontained spillage, uses of, boxes of, within. Carbohydrates, complicated versions of simple things, unseen complications from breakdown of substance, less matter, ready for shipment, nerve, impulse, axon, reduced iron, conditions of blood, but less of it, 10%. Plasma is a sort of demigod-like solution. Coagulation, milk or soup. The closet after the door shoves in persistently intermediate lost promotions pick up a newspaper and read the news the mirror is foggy the air is thick her limbs are stuck her body won't move real non-fat fruit product noun bodies floating in the water dispenser also known as yesterday peanut butter complex substance of adhesion everyone glued to each other increased friction Oleic acids, engine oil, brake time lubricant, gut coating, hang loose. Dear doctor, sir, we have removed the bottom. We have removed the bottom and all that remains is the top is the top. Is that all? The head is the top, the anterior to your posterior, forward facing anatomical position, scission of the head, unscrewed, a look in, just a minute. I wanted to tell you your moods are faring quite well today. Humors of the body swirling, less see and saw, less seen, quite gray actually. Monthly progress like this and a progression off of your regimen of medication is merited. You ask me why compound X and Y interact. It's because Z, because your brain, your brain like a fist, a compound X goes kerpow and so many stars, so many stars. As you can see, this is going quite well. Soon enough, burning a toe, pricking a finger, licking an ice cube with your tongue, capsaicin in the eyes, will soon be a connection of binary numbers, zero and one. one zero Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, one. All this will pass is passing through into the water. Zero, zero, one, zero, one, into the water where all of us belong when we bathe in the water. All eight limbs of us flagellate in agreement. Collectively, two eyes blink. I told you, two eyes blink. Zero, 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 zero. You agree, don't you? Board of Spiritual Advisors, 12 a.m., no whiskey on the shelf again. 12.01 a.m., a bag of Doritos, a box of wine, a can of Cheese Whiz. 12.02 a.m., the cat won't shut it. 12.03 a.m., after my tongue is stained yellow, it is stained purple. Be part of the transformation. When the coordinates between the floor and the ceiling become mixed up, my feet 
feel less familiar and my face does like the floor on the floor. They don't say skin is a deflated balloon after it fills and it fills with everything into my mouth all at once when it pops after it pops before that everything is hard hard wood hard leaves hard soap hard law everything got hard and seemed to stay hard everything hardened the rules were hard the payback hard it is as sticky as peanut butter underground it's cold as as cold as a hockey puck After the transformation, she could not open her right eye without considerable pain. Every time she forced it open, she heard a crunch. Tiny cast in it snapped shut. Her nose flapped a little sideways. Every time she breathed in with her, her head would expand like gills. Her nostrils slammed shut. Her heels a little stiff, her toes a little longer. She felt the need to palm the ground on hands and knees. The contact of body on ground was mostly lacking the brain. Our data set is incomplete. More examining is required, a versatile method of contabulating the entire truth. Thanks for thanks to your advice, I will be eating less brick ramen and drinking a bit more. Thank you. That was incredible, Annie. Um, and it's been such a pleasure to sit here and listen to all of you read this evening. Thank you, Brenda, so much for inviting me and uh, the Brooklyn Rail too. I've really loved this series since the pandemic began. So it's exciting to participate in a different way. Um, so I am going to read from the enhancers. Um, if you can't hear me well, let me know. Um, sometimes I'm soft-spoken. Um, but I'm I'm going to read from mid-novel. Um, so it's taking place uh, in Lumina Hills, a uh, pharmaceutical factory town. There is a fire at the factory. And uh, at the same time, main character, Hannah Marcus, is having side effects um, and some fallout from her mental augmentation valedictorian. And so everything is thrown into chaos. And I will, I will read a, a bit of this. A dark plume engulfed the factory. It's just what I had imagined my brain would look like if it were dashed open. If my mind continued in this direction, I'd become what, a pumpkin and a dimwit? An apple, solid, sweet, and wholesome, or worse, a fruit rotting. I couldn't imagine performing the same laborious tasks day after day, organizing information, pouring pills into containers, and placing containers into machines, or a future administering customer satisfaction surveys been asking, do you have a moment to tell me about your experience at the dispensary today? What kind of future would that be anyway? Though I wondered what kind of future any of us had here in Lumina, here on this hill, a speck on this planet, mid six and careening toward finish here at the beginning of my own life was the beginning of the end of life as any of us have known it. The sky was gray and all seemed bleak. I made my way past the charging stations and dispensary windows, their neon orange capsules always lit. Outside, so many suits spread across the plaza, all were tap, tap, tapping at their keys, whispering into where, what receiver, the ether? All just talk, talk, talking, their words light as a whisper in the wind, whispering as if trying to allure me. I heard wisps of, hello, love. Howdy, hey loser, order now, burning down, devastating, staggering, connected, dropping, breaking up, bitrate, ISP, rate your trip, greater frequency, greater speed. I swear I could hear synapses humming with intake, processing messages, melodies, IMs, DM swipes, all firing so rapidly, all of this unfolding happening in the air, in the pinpoint, in the spaces between, or perhaps even within us. 
We're always moving as fast as the world is rotating, but what was left to hold on to? Not much, not much, Dr. Billy had said about what I could do beyond more capsules, pills, and tablets. I was well on my way to downgrading. Not much could be done besides taking and waiting. Billy's first direction was to keep my mind at rest. A body at rest is less likely to fall, to take a spire, and if that didn't work, sedate. At least that was one of the treatments detailed in the packet Olya had sent me. It required being placed in a semi-hypnotic state for a stretch of days, weeks even, to alleviate the mental weight. I would prefer not to, I'd said to Billy, to not do any of this. And he'd smiled his menacing smile. Of course he did. That's when I started to run. The smoke over the hill was darker than I'd ever seen as I ran to the bank of the river. And as I ran, I could hear Judy's voice in my head. My device shook as if on cue. I took it from my bag. I could see Judy mouthing words. I could make out factory. I could make out falling. I shoved the device back into my bag, but somehow this unmuted her and I could hear her voice muffled. I implore you, come home, honey, please take all of your meds. Do you hear me? All of them. I mean, what if, I mean, once you're rotting, there's no stopping. These last words echoed in my head. I saw myself a putrid fruit, bottom rotting and flies above a buzz in the noonday sun. As I approached the river's edge, I saw its banks dotted with tufts of white. More tufts were floating downstream, almost like dumplings. I ran onto the bridge and stopped mid-span by a brown case atop the guardrail with the words break an emergency written across glass. Behind the small pane, a life preserver glowed orange like the pill in the dispensary window. Whoever had placed a life preserver at this precise location knew the effect of great heights on the desire to leap. Dread overcame me. Was this not an emergency? Suddenly it seemed like I'd been led here to this exact location. I broke the glass and took the preserver. It hadn't occurred to me that I would do this just now, but this was just one surface of so many things that needed breaking. I wished someone would have also placed a vial of Delixir behind the glass so I could down a handful and then leap and soar and take in the skyline and a brief wondrous flash before falling so fast. I rummaged through my pockets. All I had was anxieties. I swallowed one, then a few and climbed onto the rail I looked out at the billows of smoke before me. I waited a moment, then closed my eyes and dropped the preserver into the river. I stood on the top rail and dangled a foot over. I stood there, eyes closed, trying to will myself over. I couldn't. My arms shook as I clung to the case as I somehow guided my feet back to the concrete. I could see bodies swarming on the hill and white tents forming in a line at the top. I wanted to run to witness the chaos, but my chest felt so heavy. I sat on the concrete and then I took my device out and watched Judy's face over and over, her jaw opening and closing and opening again. Suddenly her teeth grew dark and two chimps emerged from behind my mother's molar. They wrestled onto her tongue. With her next scream, they covered their ears. I closed my eyes. Was this really happening? I spied another chimp in the shadow of her cheek. This one had a large stick and started banging on a filling. It made a tinny sound that was maddening. It made my head throb. This couldn't be happening, and yet. I watched this all play on while Judy's mouth yammered and filled with capsules of cream and navy, peach and purple, sea green and blue. These capsules filled her whole of a mouth until they started spilling out and breaking releasing liquid magentas and purple streams, dark ash falling. Judy had a halo of smoke and glow. She looked like the patron saint of something sordid. The air smelled of burnt vinegar. I heard Celia's voice in my mind repeating, what good are wings if you don't fly? I saw her in a green gown climbing through the hospital window, tiptoeing on its ledge. I saw Teague's face before me as she turned her gaze Toward the hill, I saw her platinum wig, her pearly teeth, a pomegranate seed rolling. Teague whispered as I held her hand. She said she saw a light beyond the factory. And then the warmth of a body beside me, a pair of legs, an arm on my back, curls against my cheek, a sharp familiar scent, maybe patchouli. I turned my head and saw Azzy's eyes focused, her mouth covered, her concern. 
She's, she said she'd come to look for me when I wouldn't answer her messages. She said she'd been sitting beside me on the side of the road for more than 15 minutes. That I wasn't moving and staring straight ahead, that she'd put the mask over my mouth and I hadn't responded. I told her she was crazy. She said she wished that explained it. I felt her hand on my back. I was surprised how this calmed me. Toxic crosswind, she said. Factory is burned. Burned? Incinerated. Collapsed inward. Wait, what? How could it? Chemical substances released. Indoors mandatory. They say we have nothing to worry about. It will blow over. Will it? We need to get going. Many are sick. Shallow breath, heaves and sweat. You should get checked. I'll be okay. Just come with me. We'll go see Trini. She'll make it quick. I'll stop there. Thank you. Genius, everybody. Oh my gosh, I'm just floored by all of the um, the ways that these works come together, actually. Um, yeah, I'm going to read the slightest little um, fragment because I just realize that um, my least successful mode of expression is talking because as Annie demonstrated, <laughs> I, I might, um, you know, eat too much peanut butter before the performance. Okay, so this is from a collaborative novel that um, Janice Lee and I wrote in a veritable hypnotic trance during COVID, um, we would just, get on to our Google Doc while Zooming and not talk to each other, but just write this, you know, quirky document. Um, and we did very little editing. It's kind of like a subterranean map of our brain. We tend to, we're, we're very close friends and we tend to read a lot of the same texts and we, had historically spent a lot of time together going to conferences, eco-conferences. And so this is like the culmination of all the ideation and thinking together and honestly cherishing each other's um, sentient beings. Um, so it may come across a little um, uh, hard to fathom, as I embark in the middle of the manuscript. Um, so here it goes. In the final ocean, the last ocean that will ever exist before the first one, there lies an acorn buried beneath the sand at the bottom of an unfathomable body of water, an acorn buried there for the future. Some distance away, a squirrel lifts his face up to the wind nose twitching and catching the scent of salt and tannin. About that acorn lying in wait, this isn't the time yet, the squirrel thinks to himself. The ocean archives the past by transforming matter into translucency. The ocean breaks everything down to the smallest denominator. The ocean generates an autonomous sensory meridian response and with it a flickering and a spectral jolt that conducts electricity through cells and excites the becoming of nothing like when a star bursts or when things come in and out of being. Jittery, wobbly shivers. The original ocean and the final ocean vie for attention. They overlay one another so we see through one to the other. The future taints the present if you stress out about what will happen next. This is how, this is how worlds bleed into each other. The past bloats the future with expenditure. Now the trees are filled with flowers and everything is becoming its future self and seeding and creating the possibility of another iteration. The ocean wants a final hand in all matters. Salt is a final, final form. Salt is a preserver. To be interned in salt is to rest forever. Salt is a conductor of electricity. Cows enjoy licking salt. Mammals tend to enjoy salty things. The clouds have saline in them. Salt water chokes out the flora by the shore. The waves crest and kill off the tender growth. Other plants thrive on salty brine. Razor sharp grasses that grow 12 feet high thrive on it. 
egrets with puffy plumage plunge their beaks into the brackish water, for fish and crabs are in abundance in the murky silt. The sun sets, it looks as if it were the cause of a nuclear meltdown, and as a star, that is essentially what is happening. She is becoming a giant, a red giant or a white pulsar. The squirrels are busy burning nuts out of season. And what does this mean? There was an abundance of nuts and they are busy burying them in spring. All around oak seedlings sprout. The rocks are igneous and have experienced compression and the force of deep earth. They yawn as rocks do slowly altering the ego of the dirt. One squirrel has eaten something he is unfamiliar with and it has caused him to feel dizzy and unsure, so he avoids trees. He makes his way to a cellar hole and rests there. He signals to his family, whatever you do, don't eat what I just ate, it might be poisonous. He has to wait it out, ride the strangeness of metabolism, a strange morsel. The occasional question that one might have is, how is language so broken? How are the sentences so inadequate for the dictions that occur in the shadows, the insistence of individual humanity amidst all of this catastrophe? The ocean posits happening as happening. That is, a body of water is affected by planetary bodies that also create gravity for animal bodies who insist on creating textual bodies and the water like a mother carrying a child across a field to protect it from predators, only knows to surrender and receive. Nothing is broken, says the water, because nothing is meant to be fixed, because cause and effect ignore the significance of shadows, because there are enough nuts for everyone, but not enough foresight, because there is always risk, but risk assessment borders on a categorical pinning down. Morality, if there are only two sides, is for suckers. In another space time, there is a squirrel who tracks the scent of an acorn long buried in the ocean. In this one, a, a squirrel tracks the salty scent of pre preserved fish. This isn't in his usual diet, but he accesses memory of a future life and is drawn to it. The allure is stomach, stomach churning, but he feels his nose tremble. The other squirrels are not prepared. He is not prepared and this fish isn't for them. And yet this future memory has ch charged itself in this moment. And this particular moment of harm will also become a past memory for that future self because memories are entangled like the molecules of water. A sacred occult map is the only way the acorn can be located and recovered from the ocean. And when there is the realization that the ocean is internal as it is external, two parts of the same whole, spatial dimensions bend oddly. To find the way back or into somewhere requires a relenting, a giving up and succumbing, not in defeat, but recognition, reabsorption. If you don't allow yourself to slip out of your membrane, you will always be an impersonation of reality. Maybe impersonation isn't the right description of this phenomenon. It is okay to stay within the membranes as an option. Maybe seed is better. Just stating, but never popping open the membrane. In death, the action is done for you. It happens automatically. You don't have to try. You will rot or burn or be eaten. You will, cha you will change form. There are rigors involved and risks. Maps leading out of oneself into another are available. You won't resume in, in the exact form. You might feel out of sorts, a bit confused, speaking altered, alternative languages, speaking oddly, the body transforms as it ages. The skin wants to shed, prefers to wrinkle. And you look at the wrinkled person and you might feel awe. You may not notice all the people who are old and wrinkled and have a different sensibility. 
The squirrel was old and his arm was broken and climbing was rough going, very rough going. Twice he fell out of a tree. He managed to catch a branch both times. He couldn't fight other squirrels for food. He had to wait it out and get the nuts that were bruised or moldy. He ate more moldy food and this affected sensation and perception. He was ignored by his family circle. The trees dropped more acorns this year than ever in his memory and his strength was improving. He was feeling livelier and was able to get about the tree trunks with agility. He ate as much as he could to fortify himself. He dreamed as many hours as he could. The longer he dreamed, the more energy he had. He encountered a badger and he encountered an eagle lately. He also came into contact with rabbits, rats, and field mice. He noticed numerous crows. There were many to greet and acknowledge. Oceans are intent on expansion. They will envelop land if the conditions are right. When temperatures rise, water molecules expand. Thus, the sheer volume of water expands. Sea levels are rising, ice is melting, warm oceans chew at the ice. Ancient ice contains minerals and is darker in coloration. When exposed to the sun, the dark layers melt quicker. Each subsequent layer of ice melts at an increasingly rapid pace. The oceans are interested in primordial beginnings, beginnings again, a new beginning after many starts and die-offs a repetition of beginnings and beginning again. All water bodies prefer to run toward the oceans if conditions are right. The saltiness is a draw. The sheer distribution of the volume of water is magnetic. Water is heavier than ice, denser. A maximum density in liquid form. Water is thought of as the stage of hiding and is associated with bones and ears. The moon and water commingle. It feels as if time moves in peculiar fashion. The ocean regulates time with the moon, recalibrating the mistaken rhythms, the breath out of sequence. Rising outside the dualism of good and evil, the ocean's turbulence is beyond moral bounds. The triangle is the alchemical symbol for water. The word for emerald and the word for water are the same in ancient Egyptian language. Salts and minerals dissolve in water, contributing to the ocean's chemistry. The acidity or alkalinity of the ocean fluctuates. Responding teasingly, the ocean swishes mammoth tonnages of liquefied ions that become waves. If anyone can predict the future, it is the ocean. And I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thank you. I feel like I'm surrounded by sheer genius. Um, complex intelligences and you know it's it's just breathtaking and i'm glad to um be associated with you all take care thank <clears throat> excuse me thanks brenda <laughs> i'm gonna take moralities for suckers with me into the rest of the day in particular um Thanks also, Anne and Annie and Daisy and Gia and Elvia. Uh, this was a terrific reading. And um, so great to hear everyone. And why don't, oh, and thanks to all the cats. There was a lot of cat appearances made across the uh, screens. Um, should we throw up in the mics, unmute everybody to say hello and goodbye and go off into the rest of the day or the night, depending on where one is? Thank you. Genius. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.